presentation bit. All right, great. So um, we would like to welcome <laughs> Philippe Lemoin. No, no good. Anyway, Close enough. <laughs> yeah, he's, uh, he's, he's joining us today from Paris, as I understand it, and he's going to talk to us about some modeling considerations with compartment models that have been used widely during the pandemic. Um, I just want to mention that um, uh, I, I invited uh, him today because uh, in the you know, in that first year of COVID, there people, lots of people were writing lots of things. Um, and I have a background, my undergraduate degree is in philosophy of science, and uh, my ma master's degree is in optimization. And then I went on to do statistics, which was kind of like the combo of the two. Um, but I routinely think to myself that um, ideas from the philosophy of science don't really make it into the mainstream world of data analysis as much as I sort of would like. Um, and Anyway, I, I saw some things that um, Philippe had written that had sort of addressed some of the concerns that I just didn't see anywhere else. And so I thought it would be really nice to have him come and sort of explain some of these issues. Um, so if you would like to introduce yourself, feel free in terms of your affiliations and whatnot, but we're very glad to have you and we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm, a, uh, I'm a fellow research fellow at the Center for the Study of Partisanship and Ideology. Uh, which is a sort of think tank that, that was created recently. And, and I'm also a PhD candidate at Cornell University in philosophy of science, um, as you mentioned in your presentation. And uh, I guess like a lot of people, I just started uh, getting into uh, okay. modeling because you know we were all uh, obviously concerned by what was happening, uh, or trying to make sense of, uh, of uh, what was happening, of, of the literature. And I, I started writing about this stuff and uh, I ended up, uh, getting into this a lot, so um, so that's that's what I want to talk about uh, in this. In this talk. So uh, let me just share my my screen here, so you can see you guys have some slides. Um, so okay, is this uh, not sure this is working? Can you guys see my screen? Uh, yes, we can see it. Okay, good. Okay, it's good. not full screen though. Yeah, it's, no, it's not. It should be full screen. Go. Great. Okay, okay, I'm gonna start. Uh, yeah, so I, I call that talk uh, the poverty of epidemiology, and um, and basically uh, the reason I called it like that is because it's it's gonna be a grand tour of uh, what went wrong with epidemic modeling during the pandemic. And uh, I, I, you know, to be clear, I think a lot of things went wrong. And I also think that this fact has not been sufficiently recognized. So um, I, I'm just gonna briefly introduce the uh, uh, SEER model, which I'm pretty sure most of you are already familiar with. And, and you know, as an example of like a very simple type of uh, compartment, compartmental model, and uh, which as, as you said, uh, have been uh, widely used during the pandemic for various things. And then I'm gonna go over a few examples of ways in which those models have been deployed during the pandemic and, and explain why I think uh, those uses of, of this type of model have been uh, epistemically responsible. And, and uh, what I think, uh, in, in what way exactly I think uh, this was uh, epistemically responsible and why it led to various mistakes in, in my opinion. Uh, okay, so like I said, I'm gonna go briefly over the STIR model because I'm pretty sure that by now, two years into the pandemic, most of you are pretty familiar with it. So it's just a simple example of uh, something, of, you know, model in the class called compartmental models, uh, which are called like, like that because they divide the population into several classes. Um, and so this model divides the population into three uh, different classes. Uh, the class of susceptible people who are susceptible to infection, meaning that uh, if they're exposed to the virus, they can get infected. And um, the second class is the class of infectious people who uh, are already infected and can infect other people. Uh, hence the dashed arrow here that goes from uh, this class to the uh, class of susceptible people. And finally, the uh, class of recovered people. So those are people who were infected, but have recovered and can no longer be infected because they, have, they are no immune. Um, so they're no longer susceptible and they also uh, can't infect people because they're no longer infectious. All right, so in, in this model, uh, immunity doesn't wane. 
which means that you know when you're in the recovered compartments, you you don't go back eventually to the susceptible compartments. Uh, you're here uh, once and for all. And so, as you can see on this chart, you know the transition between the uh, there's a you, you you know people transition from one compartment to another, uh, different rates. So here. Uh, the transition from the susceptible class to the infectious class at rate lambda, which is called the force of infection. It's given by this formula here. So you can see that it's proportional to the share of the population that's currently infectious. Um, and this variable here, the beta, is often called a contact rate, uh, which is a rate at which people have contact in the population, but really should be construed as the contact rate times the probability of getting infected uh, conditional having a contact with someone who's infectious. And then, you know, people uh, transition from the infectious class to the recovered one at the rate, rate gamma, which is recovery rates. Uh, and uh, the dynamic of the system is governed by this system of differential equations, uh, which is pretty simple. And again, I'm pretty sure most of you have, uh, are familiar with it at this point, so I'm just not going to dwell on this. Um, one quantity of interest, uh, I just want to uh, briefly talk about here is a basic reproduction number. And that's the average number of people a person would infect uh, crucially in a population where everyone is susceptible uh, once they're, they become infected. Uh, so this is a, an important qualification is that's as opposed to the effective reproduction number, which is the average number of people that someone who's infectious um, infects during the course of infection of the, the infectious period. Uh, and, and, you know, but this is not necessarily in a, in a population where everyone is susceptible. In fact, it's almost never the case. So that's just in the actual population where some people are susceptible and some aren't anymore because they've already been infected or for whatever other reason. So in a SIR model, the uh, basic reproduction number also noted as R0 here uh, is given by this formula. It's, it's different in different models, uh, doesn't really matter. So this is the basic model of epidemiology, but you know it has various extensions that have been used uh, and variation have been used uh, by different people during the pandemic to study various things. Uh, this is a continuous time model, but you have also a, a discrete time version of, of this model that have also been widely used. But you know, qualitatively, the, the behavior of most of those models is, is very similar. It looks something like this. Uh, you, know, you have a, an initial phase of uh, exponential or quasi-exponential growth, and then incidence that is the daily number of infection uh, uh, grows until you hit the so-called herd immunity threshold, uh, at which point the effective reduction number uh, is pushed below, goes below one, and the epidemic starts receding, so incidence uh, goes down. Uh, There's still like a number of people who are infected after this. Uh, eventually, the epidemic is extinguished. But at this point, a lot of people have been. So you know, if you if you take a disease like COVID-19 or you know virus like SARS-CoV-2, which is believed to have had a, a uh, basic reproduction number of around three in most places. Uh, really, it's very uncertain and highly variable, but I'm going to forget, forget about this for now. Uh, uh, at the beginning of the, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, by, by the time the, uh, in this model, by the time uh, the, the epidemic is extinguished, you have like well over 90% of the population that's been infected. So that's, that's what a typical epidemic looks like in, in, this, in a model of that sort. Okay, so what, what do people uh, what did people do with this? I'm going to look now at various examples of, of what they did with this, this type of models. And so I'm going to start with the paper published in Nature in June of 2020 by Flaxman and, and his colleagues, you know, called uh, Estimating the Effect of Non-Pharmaceutical Interventions on COVID-19 in Europe. And so this is probably the most cited paper about the impact of non-pharmaceutical interventions, which I'll call NPIs from, from now on. Um, and it, it, it's about the uh, impact of those uh, government interventions in 11 European countries during the first wave. And the paper concluded that overall those interventions had saved uh, over 3 million uh, lives in, in those 11 European countries alone during that, that first wave. And moreover, uh, the model also found that beside full lockdown, the other interventions essentially had, had no effect. So really when they say that, um, NPI saved uh, 3 million lives in those 11 European countries during the first wave. What, they really, what their results really imply is that full lockdown saved over 2 million lives during that period. So how did they do it? Um, 
So they, they started from a model that's essentially a, a discrete analog of the SEER model I've, I've presented briefly before. And crucially, they've assumed uh, in that model that only NPIs could have affected transmission. So I've reproduced here the uh, crucial equation of their model. And what it says is that the effective reproduction number in country M at time T is basically the basic reproduction number in that country M modified by uh, those interventions and, and uh, you know, which are assumed to have a multiplicative effect. And uh, as you can see here, there's this term here, the sum here first. And what it says is that, so this uh, variable here, it's an indicator variable and it's equal to one if uh, um, intervention K, intervention K at time T is currently in place at time T in country M and it's zero otherwise. And alpha K is the effect of that intervention. So as you can see here, uh, each intervention, there are six of them that they considered in, in the study. Each of them is uh, assumed to have the same effect in all of the countries in the sample. But um, there's another term here, which is important as we'll see, it will play a very important role, which was introduced to add some, uh, to introduce some uh, flexibility into the model. So basically this is a country specific effect for the last intervention in each country. So this variable here, uh, it's an indicator variable that equals one if uh, the last intervention is, is in place at time T in country M and beta, beta M is the country specific effect of the last intervention in country M. So in all of the countries, the last intervention was a lockdown except in Sweden where it was a ban on public events because in Sweden there was no lockdown as uh, you're probably aware. So they started with this, they used, the, they took this model and they fitted the model with the actual data from the first wave of the epidemic in Europe in those 11 European countries. And in that way, they have estimate, they got estimates for the parameters of the model. So they got estimates for the basic reproduction number uh, in, each, um, in each country, but also for the effect of each intervention and also for the country specific effect of the last intervention in, in each of those 11 countries. And then in order to get an estimate of the uh, number of deaths that were averted by non-pharmaceutical interventions, they ran a counterfactual in which there was uh, no intervention. So those indicator variables here were set to zero. And they basically let the epidemic run its course uh, using the uh, basic reproduction number that was estimated from the data for each uh, of the 11 countries. Then they looked at how many deaths they ended up with in this counterfactual where there was no government intervention and they just subtracted the um, actual number of deaths uh, to get an estimate of the number of deaths that were averted by interventions. So you can see the result in this table that summarizes their, the, the result of this little counterfactual experiments and as you can see you get here the, the headline results of the study that you know over two million deaths were averted by uh, NPIs in in those 11 European countries during the first wave of the pandemic. So if you look more closely at the results, uh, you see what I was talking about earlier with that, uh, according to their model, uh, besides full lockdown, which had a very large effect on, on transmission, um, the other, the other uh, uh, intervention that they looked at, that they considered in the study had, had uh, no effect distinguishable from zero. Uh, so like, as I was saying earlier, when they say that uh, NPIs have averted three million death, over three million deaths, really what the results mean is that lockdown did. Um, here's a, a, just an example like to, to show you more concretely what the model feed looks like for one country. So I picked France. Uh, and as you can see, you know, uh, at first, uh, you know, the, the first interventions are put in place, but they have only a tiny effect on the effective reproduction number uh, until the uh, full lockdown is declared. And this is a massive effect. It cuts drastically the um, effective reproduction number, which translates into a, a sudden drop in the daily number of infections, which after a delay translates into a drop in the number of deaths. And, and you can see the same thing for uh, all of the other countries in the in the sample of the, that they use for the study. 
But this is weird because, you know, how come if, if you look at the same similar, this kind of graph for Sweden, you see a similar thing because, you know, in Sweden too, uh, starting in late March, uh, early April, uh, transmission uh, was cut a lot, you know, and then our uh, the effective reproduction number of the epidemic was pushed below one and eventually the, the epidemic uh, receded. So it looks as though uh, just looking at the, uh, the epidemic curve in Sweden, that the reduction of transmission was similar in Sweden and the other country, which is confirmed if you, if you plot the effect according to the model, you see that the effect, the overall effect of interventions on transmission in Sweden, it's less precisely estimated, but in terms of magnitude, it's, it's very similar to, uh, a bit smaller, but similar to, and very large to, to what you see in the other countries in the sample. And that's just weird because uh, as we've seen uh, before, you know, uh, only lockdown, according to their model, is supposed to have had any effect, but there was no lockdown in Sweden. So how is that possible that although there was no lockdown and only lockdown, according to the model, had any effect, uh, nevertheless, the, the overall effect of intervention in Sweden was very comparable to what we've seen in the other countries. So that's just, that was just weird. And when I saw that, I knew that something had to be wrong. And the only way I could make sense of it, that if you go back to the model, is that the only way I could see how this was possible is that the um, country specific effect for Sweden must have been huge and effect effectively you know, compensated for the absence of lockdown because that's the only way I could, I could make sense of you know, how the model could uh, find this. So I, I, but you don't see any of that you know, in the, if you, if you read the paper, even the supplementary material, um, you don't even see this uh, graph. You know, it's, I'm, I'm the one who plotted this. Um, so uh, what I did, I downloaded the code and I ran it on my computer and I looked at the country specific effects in different country, different countries and, and you know, I plotted it and you know, it confirmed my suspicion. As you can see, um, the country specific effect is zero or you know, not distinguishable from zero in all of the countries, except in Sweden where it's much more tightly estimated and, and, and uh, uh, it's huge. It's, uh, uh, very similar to the effect that uh, lockdown had uh, according to the model and had in, in the other countries, uh, which is not surprising because as I said, you know, that there had to be something that made up for the uh, composite for the lack of, of lockdown in, the, in Sweden. And, and so clearly that was the country specific effect, but they swept that under the rug. You know, if you read the paper or even the supplementary material, you don't see that anywhere. Um, even though it, it, it clearly, um, you know, it clearly undermines the, the you know, what this meant is that because of the country specific effect of the last intervention, the model found that banning public events was 45 times more effective in Sweden, which of course is ridiculous. You know, that's just, as I say here, unless you believe there are like magical theories in Sweden, that's not what happened. Really what happened is that the model is misspecified. And so, as I said before, uh, it had to ascribe the fall of transmission in Sweden to something since there was no lockdown. Uh, it ascribed it to this uh, um, uh, country-specific effect of the last intervention, which in Sweden was a ban on public events. It's not so the case that you know. If you refit, if you if you fit the data without that second term, then presumably it looks hugely different. Yeah, yeah, it probably or you know the fit in Sweden will be terrible. I, haven't, I actually haven't tried this, uh, but this is interesting. Uh, I, I could I could try just to see, but probably yeah, uh, it would be. But um, but my guess is that you'd have a mix a mix of you know, the fit would be much worse. And also uh, the effect of lockdown would be much smaller. You know? yeah, right. um, and the effect of the other interventions probably would be uh, higher because you, what I did do is, is do a, a run a, a non pool version of the model. And, and, you know, when you run it on Sweden, so, you know, instead of pulling the data from the country, you estimate the model on each country separately, basically is what I mean by a non pool version of the model. And, uh, and when you do this for Sweden, you find that uh, the last interventions uh, you know, the, the ban on public event had a very large effect, you know, even with, of course, like when you don't pull the data from different countries, you don't need a, a country specific effect. You're just estimating the model on, on one country. And yeah, you, you find that uh, this, uh, uh, this intervention that's uh, according to the pooled version of the model had no effect, uh, had a huge effect. So yeah, um, uh, you know, so like I said, this, this totally undermined their main conclusion, but it's, it's nowhere 
you don't see that anywhere in the paper, which of course you don't see it because as I say, just undermine their, their main conclusion. What I find more surprising is that uh, reviewers or editors didn't ask for it. That's really, to me, uh, uh, really extremely weird because, and, and I know they didn't because, you know, Nature published the referee report and you, you can read the exchange between the authors and the referees and they asked about a number of things, but the elephant in the room, they didn't ask any question about it, which, which you know, is extremely weird to me. But anyway, so this, this paper now is one of the most cited uh, papers on the impact. In fact, it is the most cited paper, as far as I can tell, on the impact of non-pharmaceutical intervention, but it has this glaring flow that has been noted by some other people, but overall has not been received a lot of discussion, uh, which is, is quite incredible if you ask me. Um, so, you know, what happened, you know, I think one plausible explanation of what happened is that uh, even in the absence of any strict government interventions, as in Sweden, I mean, there, there were, so to be clear, there were some uh, restrictions in Sweden, but just much less stringent than in the rest of Europe, particularly in countries like France or the UK or Spain. Uh, where lockdowns were extremely stringent. Uh, but when you look at, uh, you know, what happened probably is that there were voluntary behavioral changes uh, that, that did most of the work, even in the absence of those interventions. And, and you see some evidence of this if you look at mobility data from Google um, during that period in Sweden, you, you can see that um, there was a massive drop in mobility. That suggests that even without a lockdown, basically, people voluntarily hunkered down because they were scared of the virus, uh, like many people, especially at the beginning. And so they reduced the, the num their number of contacts and you know, the, the transmission was cut uh, even without uh, very stringent government interventions. So that's certainly a plausible hypothesis. And if that's the case, you know, uh, it suggests another way, uh, I think a more uh, sensible way of, of doing their counterfactual experiment to, to estimate how many deaths were averted by lockdown. So instead of running their, the counterfactuals they, they ran you know, in the studies where uh, they, they, they just let the epidemic run, run its course without any interventions, uh, you assume that in every country, all of the um, uh, interventions that uh, actually uh, happen, happen except for the lockdown, and then you assume that those interventions had the same effect in those countries that they had in Sweden on, on transmission. And you, you run this counterfactual experiments. You look at how many deaths there were, you subtract the actual number of deaths and you get a, a different estimate of the number of deaths that were averted. So here in the, with this version of the model, I found that when you do this, uh, you conclude that uh, lockdowns have saved uh, about 200,000 lives, which is more than one other magnitude fewer life saves than uh, their estimate in the paper. So to, to be clear, I'm not saying that this is a good estimate of the number of deaths that were averted by lockdown. In fact, I have absolutely no doubt whatsoever that it's not a good estimate, uh, at least that, you know, in the sense that I don't think we have any good reason to trust this because it's still based on their model. And as I've argued before, I think their model is completely misspecified. I'm just saying, if you're going to do this kind of counterfactual experiment, I think this was a using this model, I think this was a much more sensible way of doing things, but that, that's not what they did. And you know, if they had done this, uh, they wouldn't have been able to get their headline uh, conclusion, you know, the one that, that you saw everywhere in the media at the time about how lockdown had saved 3 million uh, lives you know, in, in those 11 European countries alone just during the first wave. So yeah, they, they didn't do that. Um, so anyway, uh, that's just like, um, Oh yeah, no. The, the, before I, I go to a, another example, I just wanted to note too that if you, you can use, you know, another thing, interesting thing you can do, you can use simulation to show the danger of, of baking strong assumptions in your model. So, you know, basically what happened here is that they, they, they uh, start from the assumption that only NPI's government intervention could affect transmission. So given that uh, the number of infections went down everywhere, the model had to ascribe this to something and the model was set up in such a way that the only thing it could ascribe it to was government intervention. So what it did is that it ascribed it to government intervention. That's totally unsurprising. So one thing I did is I simulated a fake epidemic where um, the effective reproduction number goes down smoothly like this. There are interventions, but they have no effect on it by assumption. So it just goes on smoothly. You can imagine that it's because of voluntary behavioral changes. Um, and you know, as a result, the number of infections uh, uh, goes down too, and the same thing for death with like a delay. 
And what I did, I took those simulated data and I fed them to the model, the same model they used in the paper. And I asked the model to estimate the effect of those interventions, which I know had no effects because in the, you know, I, I know what the data generating process is. And I know that by assumption, they had no effect whatsoever on transmission. So I fed this, this uh, simulated data to the, to the model. And here's what the model found. It found the same thing as with the actual data. So, you know, the, uh, the causal story tells, uh, even though I know that this is not at all what the data generated process looks like, uh, was the same. And what this illustrates is just that when you make this kind of strong mechanistic assumption, uh, you, you know, your model, even if the data generating process is completely, the actual data generating process is completely different from what, from the data generating process that's, that you assume in your model, the model is, is still gonna give you, tell you the same story. And, and, and you know, I think we have good reasons to, to believe that this something like this actually happened. Um, and it illustrates the fact that just because, which you know, is a well-known fact that I'm sure everyone who's listening to this talk knows this, but often people tend to forget about the implication this has. It's just because you get a good fit to the data, because look here, I have a great fit to the data. The model was fitted on, on uh, death data. And you know I have a great feature, just as good as what they have uh, in with the actual data. Just because you have a good fit to the data doesn't mean that you know you get uh, you can recover a causal effect from this. And I, I think this illustrates the danger of making those strong assumptions. I, I'm just going to jump in for those of you that don't think about this. Right? Like this, this needs to be done for every model. And I don't know if it's done and then people don't talk about it or if it's not done because people don't know about it or if it's not done because people don't want to do it. But it, it, it's absolutely the case. Like if you have a model and you have data and you fit it, you'll get an estimate. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah, it, yeah. So it, it, will, it, it will, you will get a number. Whether or not that number is true uh, is a completely separate issue. And this is a great example of that. Yeah, yeah. And so in, in philosophy, we call this the under, under determination of uh, theory by evidence. And, and you, know, you, you can actually show you know, in principle that uh, no, no matter for, for any data, you know, you can, there are always like infinitely many possible models that will fit them. You know? and, and so uh, if, if you want to, uh, you, you can't you know, basically, you, you can't just go from the data. You, you need to have, but again, you know, people know this, you know, people who do apply statistics and like you, you need, you know, your, your, I'm going to go back to this later in the talk, but um, if you use, uh, if you use uh, uh, statistical tools, your statistical tools are only as good as the assumption on which they rest. And, you know, if the assumptions are no good, uh, the, the tools are no good too. And, and to make those assumptions, you need a lot of background knowledge about the underlying causes processes and very often you're not really in a position to make those assumptions. So anyway, that's that's one big example of how those models have been deployed in what I think is an epistemically irresponsible way. Um, you, you'd think that they would have learned their lesson with this episode, but they didn't. Um, I mean, why would they? Because they were able to publish that in Nature. So, um, And so uh, another example I want to discuss uh, is what happened uh, after late uh, 2020 when you you know those uh, variants of concern started to emerge. Uh, first of all, the alpha, the, the so-called British variant, which no at the time had a different name. Now it's called alpha, and um, you know those variants were believed to be and are still are believed to be more transmissible. And to be clear, I do think they are more transmissible, um, and they were associated with large waves of infection. But what happens is that every time uh, epidemiologists made apocalyptic predictions based on, on their estimate of those variants' uh, transmissibility advantage over the, the previously established lineages, uh, and which you know implied a very high basic reproduction number, which in turn meant that you were going to have huge waves. And it turned out that the waves that they projected uh, were uh, not nearly as large as what they were, much larger than what actually happened. Uh, so here's an example of what happened in France at the beginning of 2021. And, and those are those graphs show uh, projection by the INSEAM, which is the main research institution that does this stuff in France for the government. So they, they made projections for uh, the French government that was used to guide policy. <clears throat> and so this graph here shows the projection they made in mid-January. So, you know, that's when Alpha, we knew that Alpha was already in France and that it was already spreading. And they, 
they made those projections about um, hospital daily hospitalizations. Um, so this this first those projections here were made uh, in mid January. So the lining grays are the different scenarios for their projections, and in red is what actually happened. So as you can see, their projections like vastly uh, overshot uh, compared to reality. And here in this other graph, uh, this um, these are their projections from the beginning of February. So they adjusted, and but as you can see, they also were. Uh, they also vastly overshot. And actually, it's funny because I, I don't see, like, they, they made another set of projections um, two weeks later. And amazingly, they were even worse. Uh, you'd think, you know, that it improve as more time goes by, they have more time to adjust to, uh, to get the, the actual parameters right, but no, they, they were even worse. Um, so, okay. Um, so what went wrong? I think, uh, you know, like I said, you know, the basic logic, what happened is that they, they used the variance initial gross advantage to estimate its transibility advantage. So, you know, you, you have a relationship between the gross of uh, the gross rate of, a, of the epidemic and the uh, reproduction number. It's mediated by the, the generation time distribution, where if you make some assumption about the generation time distribution from a gross, uh, gross rate, you can um, you can get a reproduction number and, and using that you can estimate uh, transmissibility advantage or actually, as I'm gonna explain, it's much harder than it looks. Um, but anyway, that's what they did. And they plugged that estimate into their models. And uh, because they, the initial gross, you know, initially the, the variance had a very large gross advantage, uh, this translated into a very high basic reproduction number, which explains, um, why uh, you get those uh, projections that go to the sky, basically. Uh, and then this is problematic for two reasons. Uh, one of them is that uh, there is a crucial distinction between a transmissibility, a conceptual distinction between a transmissibility advantage and a transmission advantage, which I think they didn't pay uh, sufficient attention to. And another problem is that estimates of the transmission advantage are very sensitive to the assumptions you make at, about the generation time distribution. And this is important. I'm gonna start with the second problem here. Uh, what I did, I did a sensitivity analysis where I looked at the literature on the generation time distribution. And you know, you have like uh, the literature is kind of estimates in the literature are kind of all over the place. So I, I took only, um, I took a range of uh, estimates of the parameters of the generation time distribution that, that seem plausible based on the published literature. And I looked at how different the estimate of alpha's transmission advantage based on its early gross advantage in January in France, which is what they use for their projection, uh, would look like depending on, you know, if you, if you span the range of plausible for the parameters of the generation time distribution. And as you can see, you get like very, like the, the estimate of the transmission advantage is extremely sensitive to the assumptions you make about the generation time distribution. So it can go here from 70% to like something like 25%, which is very different. And in fact, you know, this, I have only varied a few things here. I could have, it could be even worse, you know. Uh, but the, and the problem is that in their projection, they only considered, uh, they just assumed that it was 60%. You know? I mean, they made some, um, what they call a sensitivity analysis was just, trying the same projection for 50% uh, or 70%, but uh, they only looked at this part of the uh, possible values. And, and of course that were very high. So that's, that's uh, they ended up with uh, those uh, really apocalyptic, apocalyptic predictions. Um, another problem is that uh, there, there is a very important conceptual distinction between a transmission advantage and a transmissibility advantage. And it really matters. And it's very important to, to be clear about this distinction uh, because if you're not here, you, you can greatly uh, underestimate how difficult it is to estimate a variance transmissibility advantage. So a variant has a transmission advantage over another in a given context, if and only if people infected by this variant in this context infect more people on average. So crucial in this definition is that a transmission advantage is it, it always refers always relative to a given context. For instance, France in January of 2021. Now, a variant has a transmissibility advantage over another, if and only if other things being equal, people infected by, by this variant infect more people on average. And here you, you have a, 
what philosophers call a Keteris paradox clause, which is very important. Um, it's very important because the, the, the distinction means that uh, a, a variant, even if a variant has no transmissibility advantage over another, it can easily have another, a, a transmission advantage or a transmission disadvantage for that matter. Uh, if there's, for instance, if they're spreading, so say that uh, suppose for the sake of the argument that alpha in fact had no trans was not more intrinsic so this is more about intrinsic transmissibility really and suppose for the sake of the argument that alpha was no more tr uh, intrinsically transmissible than the um, original version of the virus um, which again I, I don't think is the case i do think it was more transmissible just not as much as they assume but suppose for the sake of the argument that it wasn't uh, more transmissible but that in january of 2021 uh, in France, the variant was spreading in networks where uh, people, uh, there were more susceptible people. Whereas the previously established lineages, they were circulating in networks where most people had already been infected, so there was less susceptibles anymore. Uh, in that case, you know, the, the variants would be able to spread more easily, and so it would have a transmission advantage, even if it doesn't have a transmissibility advantage. And you could easily mistake this transmission advantage for a transmissibility advantage, which I think is what they did. I mean, again, I, I do think alpha is more transmissible, but I think the initial gross advantage uh, overestimated it. And indeed, you know, if you look at transmission advantages uh, and you measure them and you plot them over time or across space, you see that they're highly variable. And we saw that in France, you know, if you look at what happened with alpha. So at the beginning of you know, the expansion of the, of the variant in France, uh, it had a very high transmission advantage. This should be transmission here. It had a very high uh, transmission advantage, as you can see here. And that's the value they use. They just assume that this was a transmissibility advantage, plug that into their model. But really, as the, as the variant expanded in France, its uh, transmission advantage uh, collapsed. You know, and by the time the variant was a dominant variant in France, uh, its transmission advantage was reduced to somewhere between zero and 20%. Um, you know, it's gonna vary depending on what assumptions you make about the generation time distribution, but the basic pattern, you know, of this collapse is the same, no matter what assumptions you, you make about this. And, and this happened again with Delta and it happened in other countries. Um, it's not just, uh, it's not that, you know, something weird happened in France. Uh, basically the transmission advantage is highly variable and you can't just look at the initial gross uh, advantage of, of uh, variant, you know, translate that into a transmissibility advantage, plug that into your model and, and make your projection. Otherwise you, what happens is what we've seen happen in, in France with those projections. But I think that's what went wrong. But what did the French epidemiologists say after their uh, projections uh, failed to materialize? I'll tell you what they didn't say. What they didn't say is that they didn't question their estimates of alpha's transmissibility advantage, even though, as I just explained, I think there are good reasons to think that they uh, overestimated it. Um, instead, they pulled the same trick as Flaxman and Al in their uh, paper about the effect of NPIs in Europe during the first wave, which I talked about earlier in the earlier part of the, of the talk, uh, which means that they used a model that effectively assumed that only government interventions could have affected transmission. And, uh, and then, you know, they fitted the, the real data to this model. And of course the model concluded that um, uh, the, there was a curfew that was put in place in France in, on January uh, 16, had, uh, you know, avoided, like it was responsible for why their earlier uh, apocalyptic projection didn't come true. It was all thanks to this curfew that massively cut transmission. And that's how we were saved from their earlier projections. So this is what they did in this paper. It's the same research group than uh, the one that did the, uh, the, the, uh, the projections I, I showed earlier. Um, so really the story they, they told is that, uh, if you go back here, uh, you know, there's this super transmissible variant, which you assume to be 60% more transmissible than the, the wild type that was introduced in France in late December. Um, and it spread, you know, slowly, well, not slowly, actually, rapidly took over in France. So, you know, other things being equal, this should have massively increased the basic reproduction number and resulted in those uh, 
um, a massive increase in hospitalization because there were that matches, you know, massive increase in infections. Uh, but it didn't happen because in, on, in mid January, the French government introduced a curfew and this curfew more than compensated the, um, the effect of the spread of the super transmissible virus. That's the story they told, but you know, because that's what their model found. But of course their model found that because it's the same thing as the Flaxman uh, paper before. Uh, you know, the model, the only thing it could describe the fact that that the basic reproduction number uh, didn't explode is this uh, government intervention. So that's, so of course, the model ascribed it to it because there was nothing else to which it, it could have ascribed it. So, so it really doesn't show anything. Uh, Philippe, when you get a result like that and, 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 and they're trying to explain why the projection didn't come true and then because of this thing, don't you basically have to assume that the, the adherence to the curfew was ideal. Um, I mean, in order to, like, have you have you looked into that at all? Like, like I is, mean, even if even plausible? if you, well, I mean, if you if you look at mobility data, for instance, you basically don't see any change. So you know, if you actually look at data, and of course you can say, you know, those are a poor proxy for the relevant behavior. Okay, maybe they are, but that's the best thing we have, and they they really don't show. I I don't show it here, but if you look at them, you'll see that during this period, you know, if you look at the what happened after the curfew. You don't really see any difference, which you know is in part because um, uh, because people like as you as you suggested, you know maybe we're not. I mean, in fact, I can tell you that for a fact. You know, I can tell you that from personal experience that they were not uh, adhering to the perfect to the to the curfew. That's one reason. Um, but another, you know, even if people are were adhering perfectly, you, it's it's impossible to tell in advance that this would have a huge effect on transmission. You don't know. It could even have, like, con conceivably, it could even have perverse effects. You know, like, um, it could be that uh, because of the curfew, people would have just spent uh, uh, one hour with each other taking the aperitif, as we say here. Uh, they're just going to stay over, which will increase the probability that they'll get infected. You know, because if they leave their the the, the apartment after six. Uh, they're going to get a fine, you know, if, if, if cops catch them. Um, so you, you don't know, you know, you can't really tell in advance what kind of effect it's going to have. But here, the what's kind of ridiculous is to claim that your study has proven uh, that the curfew had had this massive effect, which again, in light of what you see in mobility data is, is very implausible. But uh, again, you know, it's ridiculous to claim that your model, has, your study has proven that, given that uh, there was literally nothing else your your model could have ascribed the fact that your uh, uh, projection your earlier projection didn't come true beside the the curfew because you know if you if as long as you don't question the uh, your estimates the estimates of alpha transmissibility advantage that you plug into the model you know the shimli was 60 percent more transmissible based on the initial gross advantage of the variants uh, if you don't if you don't touch this, then uh, there has to be something else that explains because you know their their projections. If you make this assumption, it was pretty sensible. Uh, but but you know if you don't touch this, uh, there has to be something. And they say, oh yeah, it was the it was the curfew, of course. Which you know, I mean, it's, it it doesn't even make sense because it's not just that you don't see any change in mobility data. Is that you know the timing is just off? Like you know, um, like the curfew happened here, uh, and uh, but. You know how come you know you still see a rise you know in the uh, later in the period and you know this the curfew didn't change. I mean you can say maybe like people stopped adhering as much. Uh, I don't. Know, it just the whole thing just makes no sense. Um, but anyway, that's what they said. Um, and uh, and and you know that's that 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 there was no real problem with this. You know that was this paper that was actually a press conference, uh, joint press conference by the research group and the government presenting the result of this uh, paper, which was, I think, happened in, in uh, late February or maybe the beginning of March, I'm not sure, I don't remember exactly. And, you know, basically congratulating themselves on their good work because the curfew had saved us from this horrible thing. Uh, forget about the fact that in several neighboring countries, they did no such thing and essentially the same thing happened, like in Spain, for instance, um, anyway. So um, that's, that's, that's another example. And I just want to, so, you know, um, one problem with those models is the don't take into account voluntary behavioral changes. Uh, another here is that uh, there is some huge problems with the ways in which they um, 
estimated variance transmissibility advantage from the early, uh, you know, the early expansions, the, 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 the gross advantage they had in their early expansion and, and plug that into the model. And by the way, this happens not just about with alpha, you know, this happened with delta and it happened again with Omicron. Uh, they, they just like, they do the same thing over and over again. And there's, and every time, you know, if they do it again, it just does, it's like they never learn. Um, and, and so uh, anyway, uh, so that's one, you know, what, those are two reasons I think for, for this, uh, that explain the failure of those models for during those episodes, but I don't think it's the whole story. And I'm not quite sure what the whole story here is, you know, beside those, um, problems with transmissibility estimates and voluntary behavioral change. But in particular, if you, the story that about voluntary behavioral change, if you look at the data, I don't think it can be the whole story. Because if, even if, you know, there are many cases where um, it doesn't seem like voluntary behavioral changes can really explain the data. So for instance, what happened in Florida in the summer of 2020 is, you know, you see like in uh, somewhere and sometime in July, uh, the epidemic started to recede. And, and that, that happened long before, so, you know, in, in the, as we've seen, you know, in a standard serum model and, and all of its variations, this can only happen when the herd immunity threshold has been reached. But by that point, nobody does that. In, by that point in Florida, they were very, very far from the, immuni the herd immunity threshold. And yet the epidemic receded. So, you, you know, this would make sense if, as in Sweden during the first wave, there had been large change in, uh, uh, you know, large voluntary behavioral changes. And, but when you look at mobility data, you basically don't see anything. So that's very weird, you know? I mean, you, you can maybe say that the mobility data are like an extremely poor proxy for the relevant behavioral variables, but that's still, that's, that's very weird. And, and you have many such examples, you know, like another example here, these are not, if this is not infections, it shows the effective reproduction number. And this is what happened in France during the fall of 2020. And you see that um, uh, there was like those wild fluctuation of the effective reproduction number. And it don't seem to be explained uh, by uh, behavioral changes. So that's very weird. And you have many, many such examples like this. You know, basically R often undergoes those wild fluctuations. And it's not clear what can explain that, you know, it's not, you, you find such examples in cases where it can't be that new, more transmissible variants were just introduced in the population. You don't see any behavioral changes, whether they were caused by government interventions or uh, voluntary. It's really not clear what can happen. And, and as I say here, those are not cherry picked examples. There are many studies that tried, that looked at this and found that after the first wave, the, um, there was a decorrelation between mobility and, and the effective reproduction number of the epidemic and the correlation became pretty weak. So you have, you have many such cases uh, and it's quite mysterious if you use the standard framework and you know, modeling framework, uh, what, what could explain that. One, one possible hypothesis here is, is that the weather is part of the story and I'm sure it's part of the story. Uh, there are some uh, studies that have looked at this and you know, they try to control for various things, and you know, which is very difficult, but they do find that uh, meteorological variables have some effect, but it really doesn't seem strong enough to explain most of those fluctuations uh, that I'm talking about here. So that's very weird. So uh, one uh, possibility that I've explored, one hypothesis is that the so-called homogeneous mixing assumption is responsible for, for this. So this assumption, it's the, you know, those uh, traditional epidemiological models like the serum model and most of these variations, they effectively assume that people interact purely randomly, like particles in an ideal gas. You know, you can, they represent human population as ideal gases, basically. Uh, you know, so it's like particles that bump randomly to each other. And which means, you know, in the case of uh, epidemiological models have uh, interaction with each other and like can be infected in that way. But, you know, we know this is not true. We know that in reality, that's not how it works. In reality, the network, the virus spreads on a network and so, you know, and, and uh, not all uh, chains of transmission are equally likely. So for instance, you know, uh, a, a standard SEER model, it assumes that if, if I were infectious right now, I would have um, exactly the same probability of infecting the friend I'm gonna have drinks with later uh, as I have to infect some guy who lives on the other side of the country that I will never meet in my life. You know? 
uh, and of course it's, it's not true. You know, the, my probability of infecting that other guy that I will never meet in my life is zero because, well, I'm never going to meet him in my life uh, by assumption. Uh, so really not only not all chains of transmission are equally likely in reality, but most of them are not even have a probability of zero. Um, and so, you know, you can ask the question, uh, what if we relax this assumption? And the answer is what happens when you do this, it really depends on how you do it. But one, um, one uh, thing I've done, you know, one uh, hypothesis I've explored is what if uh, the network on which the virus is spreading, which really is determined by people's pattern of interaction, you know, who they meet, how often, what type of interaction they have with them, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what if this network was such as, as had what uh, people in network science call a uh, community structure, which roughly means that there are some parts of the network, sub networks, if you will, uh, that are very well internally connected, but only loosely connected to each other. And so I tried this, uh, basically generated a bunch of, randomly generated a bunch of networks in, in a way that ensured that they had this property. And so here's one example. As you can see, you know, you have those sub networks that are internally very well connected, but only loosely connected to each other. And so it's not difficult intuitively to imagine what, what would happen if the virus was introduced, were introduced in one of those sub networks. It would spread very easily within that sub networks. Then it may uh, escape to another sub networks and invade it too, but it may also get stuck in that sub network. And, and so um, you would have like, uh, you know, this, this would produce. Um, intuitively, you can see, you know, uh, uh, possibly like a, a very different dynamic than what you observe in the standard sphere, like those more like a wave-like behavior. In fact, there's an example of what happens when you, you let the virus spread on that type of network. Uh, and you assume that, so here I assume for those simulations, those simulations I did on, on this very network that I show here, I assume that there was no behavioral change whatsoever. Um, so, and yet, despite the, the lack of uh, behavioral change, as you can see here, you still have uh, uh, wild fluctuations of the effective reproduction number. Um, and, and this is despite the fact that, again, there was no behavioral change. So those fluctuations, they are just the effects of population structure, basically. And this illustrates the fact that even in the absence of behavioral changes, even in the absence of new variants that are more transmissible or less transmissible that spread in the population, you can get this type of fluctuation of, of, the, of transmission uh, just because of population structure, uh, because the virus has to spread on this network where there are bottlenecks, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it gets stuck in some sub parts of the network uh, until it manages to, to escape. And you know, in terms of infection, you can see that in this case, in this simulation, uh, you have these waves that come and go, you know, and, and that very similar to what we observe in, in reality, uh, in, in real data, um, with uh, um, uh, waves, you know, that come and go seemingly without reason. And, and you know, here in this, in this model, the reason is population structure. Of course, this is highly speculative. We don't know what the actual network on which a virus is spreading looks like. Uh, and, you know, I don't want to make the same mistake as Flaxman and his friends uh, that I criticized before, you know, the, just the fact that I can get something that looks like the sort of things we observe in real that doesn't mean that it, that um, this is what actually happens, but that's just, I think, an interesting hypothesis. Um, and, and, you know, it would explain why you have those fluctuation of R uh, that, you know, for no apparent reason. Uh, by the way, it would also explain why the transmission advantage of different variants can be so variable, as we see also again in, in real data. I don't have time to explain why, but I, I can later if you want. Uh, but you know, you, I did some simulation to show this too. It's pretty interesting. But like I said, it's highly, uh, it's highly speculative. But here's one thing that I think should give pause to people who are interested in uh, um, you know, the statistical estimations of the effect of various interventions. <clears throat> Or you know, people even people use those models to make projections. Um, if you um, if you use uh, if you know if this hypothesis is true, um, then the you can show it's very easy to show that uh, the estimates of the effects of government interventions uh, in not only in studies that use like mechanistic models like uh, the ones I've discussed earlier and during the talk, but also and perhaps a bit more surprisingly, although when you think about it, it's not that surprising. Um, 
also studies that use seemingly more agnostic econometric, econometric approaches to estimate the effect of interventions. There, you know, if, if the virus is spreading on this type of network, then those approaches result in extremely, possibly extremely biased uh, estimates of the causal effect of the interventions. And so again, even though we don't know that the network actually looks like this, the mere fact that it's not crazy and that precisely we don't know that it's not like this, so, which means we, you know, uh, we, we can't rule it out, um, means that uh, we have no good reason, in my opinion, to trust that the methods that we use to estimate the effect of those interventions are, are reliable. Because if in fact the network looks like this, uh, they're gonna produce uh, extremely, possibly extremely biased estimates of the impact of those interventions. And I think this just, and I will just conclude with this, uh, this just illustrates a, a, a more general point that, you know, again, I'm sure uh, you are all familiar with, namely that uh, the statistical tools that we use, they're only as good as the assumption on which they rest, but, you know, those assumptions in order to be able to, in, to be in a position to make them confidently, you need to have a lot of background knowledge uh, and, and you know the problem that very often, if you had this background knowledge, you you wouldn't need to use those statistical tools to to figure out what you're trying to figure out in the first place. And I think in the case of the pandemic, we we simply we simply don't have enough background knowledge to be confident that our model are well specified enough that we can use them to uh, you know for instance estimate the impact of interventions. And and I just think that uh, the pandemic should. Uh, will hopefully more, make more people reflect about this and realize um, you know, the danger of, of, um, of uh, more or less implicitly making those assumptions and when you're not really in a position to make them and then um, using those tools to this kind of methods to uh, estimate the impacts of virus interventions of interest. And that's it. Thank you. All right, everybody, um, give our speaker uh, a virtual round of applause or whatever. We, we appreciate your time. And I'm, I'm hoping that some people have some questions. I know we're, we're close to the end of the scheduled time, but- um, Yeah, sorry, that was a bit long. Uh, but if anybody has quite, if any, so if anybody needs to leave, obviously this is the time that, that you can do so and nobody will give you a dirty look. But um, if you have questions, please stick around and um, I'm sure our speaker would be happy to field them. If no one objects, I'll stop the recording now since the main body of the talk is complete and people can ask questions without the feeling that the onus of being recorded for posterity. Yeah, sure. <clears throat>